Welcome back to another stock market open live stream. It is February already. Wow, welcome. Kind of crazy. Feb 1. And uh, we are going to be looking today for big, big earnings. We have uh, the Fed meeting behind us. We got their punt on rates. Uh, looks like uh, betting markets right now are adjusting for a 35% uh, chance of a rate cut in March. I'm actually surprised people still have a 35% chance of a cut in March. I uh, I thought after uh, <laughs> that J-PAL meeting, we'd be down at like 15 or 20%. So I thought that was a little weird. Uh, and, and then we are at, uh, for May, uh, we're sitting at, uh, which is really interesting, a 95.6% uh, chance of a cut, uh, but a 32% chance of a 50 basis point cut. So you've actually got a market that's saying, okay, okay, okay. So we're gonna kick the can down the road to, to May, got it. But maybe then you'll do two cuts. So I don't know if that's banking crisis inspired or what, but uh, boy, a little, uh, little wild to see now two cuts getting priced in. Uh, and then of course, in pre-market here, we've actually got some uh, semblance of green again following the Fed meeting. Uh, Fed meeting uh, and uh, Google AMD earnings drove uh, the queues down about one point, almost 2% there, 1.96. Let's see how AMD ended that day yesterday. AMD ended uh, only down 2.54, that's wild. Thought they were down like four or 5% there. And then Google ended down 7.35. So Google got hit a lot harder and then hop onto Microsoft down about 2.69 yesterday, up 80 bips today, with uh, Apple sitting down about 1.94 and up a 61 in pre market. Tesla yesterday actually went green. If you think about it, at some point we went green uh, at, um, on Tesla before the Fed meeting. So you basically undid all of the 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 market's concern about uh elon's shares and then the fed pushed you right back down into the hole that was that was quite wild uh very bizarre day yesterday anyway uh let's go ahead and get these uh initial claims and we're looking for 212 they come out within the next like 10 seconds here all right here we go okay 224 initial claims up uh, 1898 continuing claims. That's a uh, higher than the 1839 we were expecting. Mm. Non-farm productivity up at 3.2%. We were looking for 2.5%. So productivity up and unit labor cost down at 0.5%. Uh, it, it is crazy. Uh, like a lot of the data that we're getting is just reiterating this stronger economy with less inflation but you know the concerns are like how close to the cracks are we going to let this go uh so you've got initial claims previously that got revised up uh 1000 to 215 versus 214 and then continuing claims were actually revised down in the last one by about 5000 uh but remember we just came in about 49000 uh, higher than expected on continuing claims. So a little bit of a higher move here on continuing claims, a little bit higher on uh, the initial jobless claims. Now, how could that end up manifesting? Where can we end up seeing this? Well, in jobless numbers. Then again, I still think there's a chance j -Pow had a little bit of a leak of, uh, you know, what, what, he, what they might be getting in terms of uh, uh, jobs numbers tomorrow. But... You know, that behavior yesterday wouldn't exactly imply that the job numbers are going to be that bad. So we'll see. Uh, J Powell's or f job numbers, one of his favorite indicators here, come out tomorrow. So tomorrow is February 2nd. We're going to be looking for 185,000 uh, change in non-farm payrolls. And so we'll be watching that pretty closely. Uh, let's take a listen here to see if he's freaking out or what highest level. It's only best if you're looking for claims to go higher because, of course, you want the uh, Fed to take notice and potentially lower interest rates. But that is the biggest 
continuing claims level since the third week in November of last year. We continue to monitor all the aftermath of the Fed decision yesterday. What seemed like it was a hawkish statement on first blush certainly doesn't seem to have left the markets with that taste at all this morning. And when you look at Bank of England and some of Bailey's comments, I guess the notion is, is that Europe has different aspects to inflation. Consider some of the aspects of the Ukraine and Russia war, but also the notion that inflation just because it's coming down doesn't mean it stays down, and it also doesn't mean that core rates with questions on energy are going to behave as well behaved as many think. Melissa Lee, back to you. Rick, thank you. Stick with us. As Rick had mentioned, we're seeing the reaction. Certainly in the bond market, bonds are up uh, and yields we're seeing back off just a touch. Uh, Ten-year right now, 3.914 percent. Two-year at 4.205. Joining us now for more on the data and the economy, Wendy Edelberg, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, Michael Strain, economic policy studies director at the American Enterprise Institute, and of course our own Steve Leisman. Steve, let's get to you first. How do you uh, dissect these numbers? Uh, watching the jobless claims numbers uh, ticking up. We had the layoffs report earlier at 7.30. We have the jobs report tomorrow. Uh, there is some expected weakness coming in the jobs market, uh, and, and, and that is what is a cornerstone of Fed policy. They're expecting it to come down, but the, the productivity number is very good news, but you have to be very guarded about it because we have had now two months in a row of good productivity data. Uh, they did downgrade the third quarter from 5.2 to 4.9, but both are still above trend. And, and there's been a story here, Melissa, where you had this productivity surge at the beginning of the pandemic. Low wage, less low productivity workers were the first to be laid off, surge in productivity. And then it came down. And now we're back more or less on trend with some sense that maybe we're running a little bit above trend. That's going to help the Fed in its effort to keep inflation down. One other quick thing, uh, Melissa, is everybody gets worried about the idea of will they hike in, uh, will they cut in March, will they cut in January or June, June or July? Um, I think people need to take a step back and think th there's a long game being played here. Inflation for decades in the United States was low and coming down, and it remained low. And I think what happens now will pay off and be important for what happens in the next coming decade. So if we can keep and get and break the back of inflation, the Fed can gain credibility on inflation, there will be payoff over many years. So the difference between March, July, June, May, December won't matter all that much in the long run. Melissa? Wendy, how do you interpret this data in the context? That's actually not a bad way to think about it. Like, does it really make a difference if you get the extra 25 BP now or in a couple months? Probably not most notably with UPS cutting 12,000 jobs. These numbers basically confirm what we already knew, which is that the economy performed really well last year, even as the labor market was slowing to a more manageable pace. My guess is that we're actually not going to see, if the Fed does its job right, my guess is that we're actually not going to see the labor market slow much in terms of wow. payroll growth relative to what we've seen. 175,000 a month might sound like a lot, but given the population growth numbers that I'm now seeing coming out of the Congressional Budget Office, we should get used to about 175,000 a month in terms of payroll growth for a while now. So I think the labor market is basically at a sustainable level, and I think the economy is doing really well. Will we not see the jobs picture worsen at all, Michael, in your view? Uh, I, I expect that we will see the jobs picture worsen. Uh, there, there are you know, reasons to believe that uh, the labor market mm -hmm. is being helped by some supply side factors uh, it will dissipate uh, in the coming months and that might make it harder for the labor market to withstand the current level of the federal funds rate, especially if the Fed kind of kicks any rate cuts into the second half of the year. I don't think we're seeing it in these, in these claims data. I disagree a, a little bit with Steve. You know, the four-month moving average uh, was 208,000 initial claims. That's kind of right in the ballpark of where we've been for the last three months. It's less than where we were prior to that. Um, and so, you know, yes, lots of layoff announcements, lots of anecdotes about data. Uh, I'm sorry, lots of anecdotes about layoffs. I don't see them in, in this claims report. I think, I, I think uh, uh, this is another indication that the economy finished the year really, really strong. Rick, you mentioned that, um, you know, in the light of morning, it doesn't seem like the bond market necessarily believes it was a really hawkish message. 
from Powell yesterday. What's your specific interpretation of what's going on in the longer end, the 10 year yield uh, ticking lower here, and, and what the inference should be about economic outlook or the, or the risk that the Fed stays here too long? You know, I think the long end has had a shift. There was a focus on servicing the debt, issuance of debt. You know, many were saying, why doesn't uh, the general public feel more happiness regarding the Biden administration's economic landscape? Well, I think there's two reasons. Prices are significantly higher than pre-COVID, and people understand debt. They really do understand debt. But I think the handoff has been to a slowing economy, even though many of our guests, present guests included, are very enamored with the uh, level of economic activity this far after all the money we spent on COVID. Uh, I still think in the grand scheme of things uh, that a slowdown is coming. And I also think that when it comes to inflation, the market's going to have a tough time trying to divine what the Fed ought to do, if not the Fed itself. Because many, including me, believe that inflation probably would have come down on its own anyway. How much has the five and a quarter, uh, five and a half policy actually made a difference? It doesn't seem to be slowing the economy down, that's for sure. And interesting. with regard to lingering issues of inflation, like long-term energy costs and uh, botched handoffs into EV. Just look at how many are on the lots. Uh, no rate from the Fed is going to help some of those situations or take the pressure off future inflation. Uh, so I think that the Fed's job is that much more difficult. But don't look for 10-year no yields to spend significant time, in my opinion, under 4% especially as we start to near the refunding that's coming up, more size in threes, tens, and thirties, and arguably people are going to question whether the Treasury really is going to be able to keep size of the auctions uh, uh, in hand and that this is the last increase in some of those uh, packages for refundings. I think it's so interesting. He, he's got this POV that, oh, treasuries are going to go up. He, he's always excited when treasury yields go up. He gets sad when treasury yields go down. We know that. It's, it's, like, a little, it's like a little light switch. Uh, but interesting, his opinion is the downturn is coming, which should imply lower yields, uh, and that the Fed didn't actually have to raise rates to get inflation down. That's an interesting argument. Uh, who knows? Maybe, maybe there could be some truth to that. But uh, well, the idea that if the downturn is coming, yields are going to stay higher, unless, he, I mean, the only way to really reconcile that is if, if he thinks yields are going to stay higher, and that'll cause the downturn, uh, and the Fed will unnecessarily keep yields high. That would be the way to maybe reconcile that. Anyway, okay, so let's take a look at a little bit of Bank of England. Bank of England uh, does not need to see inflation at target to cut rates, but the evidence is getting us there. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so uh, how are they wording this? Does not need to see inflation at target to cut rates. Okay, this is this is coming after probably, uh, you know, the, the same sort of argument the Fed makes where, hey, hey, like, as long as we're on the trend there, we'll go ahead and cut. Uh, evidence, uh, evidence that it is getting there. Okay. What else do we have from Bank of England? Bailey. Okay, this is a little tax policy talk. Y you know, I always think it's funny when these other central banks talk after Jerome Powell because they start sounding a lot like him. It's like they wait for Jay Powell and, and then they write their homework, you know, they kind of copy it. Uh, let's see here. Asked if the bank can bring down inflation without a rise in unemployment. Bailey points out joblessness will have to increase, but things are looking better. Well, that's what uh, j Pow said last year and then that never increased. Uh, they've reduced their expectations for how persistent inflation will be. However, the second phase might take longer to play out like the second phase of getting inflation down. Boy, we've heard that before from j Pow too. So Bloomberg Economist looks at a first cut in May for the Bank of England. Uh, let's see. Okay. But may, okay, but may move to June. What about our June? Let's see when our June meeting is, because 
Uh, we'll see, Let's see, June, 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 June. Ah, yeah, so that's six weeks later. So you have your March 20th meeting, and then May 1st, which is about five-ish weeks. And then from May 1 to June 20, you get about six-ish weeks. Uh, they're all somewhere between five and a half to, to, to six weeks apart. So maybe it's not that big of a deal. It just, it feels a lot closer May 1st <laughs> than June. Okay. So we've got, let's see here. They held rates. Okay. Bailey is asked if the next move will be a cut or a hike. He says the key question has moved from, oh, here's an interesting one. How restrictive do we need to be to... How long do we need to maintain this position? Well, again, that's a, just a copy and paste from j -Pow. How How long? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, this is uh, Esther George is coming up. Now, what's interesting about her is she is the fearful labor one. So she might give us some some spanking about what uh, where the Fed's heads could be after yesterday's FOMC meeting when it comes to labor. She doesn't work at the Fed anymore. I wonder where she does work. See, it's it's not a surprise for them to go from uh, from the Fed to some kind of private job where they use their title as having been at the Fed for as a tool. I mean, it makes sense. Anyway, let's get off the commercial there. Just look at what we wrote down over at eHack. eHack.com. Esther George, she, former bank president of the Fed of Kansas. Now, what do you do now? I think she just retired. What? Yeah, no job yet. If anybody wants to hire Esther George, looks like she's available. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we'll see what they say uh, when they pop on here. Okay, uh, so that's Bank of England. We got the economic data. Remember, tomorrow's job, uh, non-farm payrolls day. We're looking for 185 on non-farm payrolls. We're looking for average hourly earnings of 0.3. Year over year, we're looking at 4.1. Uh, true inflation chart. Okay, you want me to look at the true inflation chart? All right, well, let's go find out. Uh, who does that one? Is that uh, is it, was that Dallas who does that true inflation? Uh, there's a there's one Fed that does the true inflation. Unless you just mean the website true inflation, we can look there. True Fed. Let's see here. I I usually don't look at this one, so I think it's interesting. All right, well I'll, I'll work on finding that. This is somewhere. It's one of the feds has it. Ah, oh, Cleveland has it. That's it. Uh, got it. Ah, interesting. Well, I wouldn't say that's necessarily a plummet. So this is uh, Cleveland's now casting. And they're looking at a year-over-year -year CPI of 2.96, core CPI of 3.81. Month over month changes yesterday, core PCI 0.32 and uh, 0.18 for the headline. But 0.32, that's not, 0.32 times 12, that's still 3.84. So that's still a little a little elevated there if, uh, if your now casting comes in uh, like this. Now cast has January year over year PC coming at 2.19. Is that true? Let's see. Oh, headline PC, yeah, right here, 2.19. Yeah, I see that. And they're always high. We could see headline year-over-year -year PC this month. I'm assuming you mean under 2%. Yeah. Oh, Mitch is like meeting at 9, happy about it? Nope. <laughs> Sorry. Here's an interesting quote. Yeah, this is what I was thinking about yesterday. Uh, New York Community Bank waded into a regional bank crisis. Yep, that's true. And uh, buying up failed assets. And now they are having their own problems with that. All right, let's, let's listen to this. 
When do you think uh, we, we should start expecting cuts, given that the market seems to get ahead of itself a little bit? Yeah, good morning, Andrew. Um, yesterday, I think, was a reminder to everyone that the Federal Reserve is squarely focused on uh, its mandate of getting inflation back to target of 2%. And so um, after the December press conference, obviously the, the forecast that showed a series of rate cuts in 2024 set in motion, I think a growing consensus that that would happen sooner rather than later. And I thought the chairman was very clear yesterday that the committee will move on a timeline uh, that involves their being right. highly confident. Um, and when that happens is hard to tell. So from your vantage point though, is that an April situation, a March situation? I mean, not a March situation, a May situation. Is that a, we're just waiting for things to firm up and so we just want an extra month. We need multiple months. Yeah, so if you listen to uh, the emphasis on obviously six month averages of inflation are looking very positive, but the committee has a long horizon in terms of thinking about year over year, which is still running higher. So I think when you see the March meeting outcomes absent any um, unexpected shocks to the economy, you're gonna see a new set of forecasts coming out of this committee. And I think uh, further discussion about the progress they've seen in the months following this meeting. And I think then an opportunity to provide a better signal. So clearly, um, I think the committee is in line to begin cuts this year. March is gonna give us some more information about whether May uh, is the timeline to do that. And I suspect the first half of this year, assuming things go as they have been, is an opportunity to do that. Was this a surprise for you? Because we talked to Roger Ferguson. This was not a surprise to him. But to some degree, it seems like it must have been a surprise to the market when I would argue maybe it shouldn't have been. Yeah, I think the surprises come uh, following that December meeting. I think that was taken as a, a pretty significant uh, signal of cuts coming. And I think as people began to look at six month averages and remember, this is a committee trying to balance going too soon versus too late. Too soon meaning you allow inflation to reignite, you relive the 70s experience versus too late, meaning you do damage to the economy. And right now we hear the committee members talking about um, a soft landing, a path that does uh, no harm. And I think we have to wait and see. That timing is consequential. The chairman said that would be consequential in terms of when they started that uh, cycle. So um, it's, a, it's a challenging time for this committee, I think. For sure. And President George, even with the just slightly softer than expected, uh, you know, unemployment claims number today, you've seen the bond market move again. I mean, two year yields are back toward their lows. The market's going to continue to try to maybe over anticipate the initial cut. And perhaps it's because what we know about the Fed's stated outlook means they're further along on the inflation uh, progress and the economy's held up well. And so they, they, they seem like where rates are right now looks increasingly out of step with where we've come for inflation. So I, I just wonder uh, if you think that eventually uh, just that's the market's logic. Look, we, we know what they've told us about. We don't want to be too restrictive if inflation's going down. So let's get started. No, I think <clears throat> I think you've described it exactly right, which is the, the risk on both sides has been highlighted, the risk of reaccelerating inflation, but the one you noted, which is staying restrictive too long, we know historically has consequences to the economy. And I think when you watch the banking system and you see some of the credit issues being highlighted, you look at asset classes like commercial real estate, it is a reminder of how uh, the policy adjust and how it affects the economy over the longer term. Again, I think the message yesterday was clearly greater confidence because once we start, it sounds like there will be a series of cuts to follow and the committee will want to be highly confident in doing that. President George, I want to thank you for your perspective on all this this morning. It's great to see you. Thank you. Coming up, the countdown to Apple earnings is on after a break. Analyst Tony Sakanagi gives us a preview of the numbers due after the bell. Stay tuned. You're watching Squawk Box on CNBC.
Light work. Sorry. Uh, I listened to all that. I was just slow at getting back. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I had to. I had to go visit something. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so um, uh, I one of the things that I really took away from from what Esther George here said was that once they start, the series of cuts is coming. I actually like how she brought up the banking crisis. She's like, hey, like, w once they go, they're going to go. So, <laughs> so they'd rather kind of kick the can down the road a little bit in terms of when they go, because when they go, we, we's it going. And I think that's very interesting, actually. And I think she's actually right. Uh, if we look at uh, FOMC rate... Uh, let's fact check myself. Let's look at this. We'll do this together. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, this is what I thought. So, <clears throat> look at this for a moment. You start cutting a little bit, and then it plummets. And then you get a plummet. Here's just a plummet. I mean, these are in recession, right? But look at this. You go up, and then it plummets. And uh, we had this period of time where rates were slowly going up over here in 87. Large rise, and then a pretty rapid drop of about a percent and a half. You go from 89 to about 91, and you're kind of stable over here. And then what? Plummet. So, like, you know, here's a longer period of rates somewhat trending down. Right? A little, little all over the place. 95, a few cuts, one hike, a whole percent of cuts, and then boom, you're all, all the way in. So the Fed has a really bad reputation for starting to cut and then like not rapidly cutting after that. So that's an interesting thing to consider when we think about the Fed because it really suggests, wait a sec, okay, if the Fed is going to end up cutting big, then we're probably at a place where the, it would make sense that the Fed has decided, you know what, we're going to chill, we're going to relax uh, until we are convinced that, uh, uh, that we've done enough. So I, I think that's very interesting. Um... Be, and then and then we'll we'll plummet rates, <laughs> which is as quite possible too. Uh, hey, maybe that'll be convenient, you know, right before the election, to about half the country, and the other half will be a little pissed. All right, I got your trueflation chart here. Here's uh, trueflation. So this is what some of y'all were talking about in the chat. Look at that drop off! Holy smokes! Why did that plummet half a basis point today? Uh, this is on the year-over-year -year chart. Very interesting. Uh, and so what do they see? Oh, this is kind of cute. Look at this. They did a nice little put-together here. Food trending down. Uh, actually, in deflation. How about housing? Housing, somewhat stable. Transportation, all negative. Utilities, negative. What we got over here? Health popping up again. Household daily items. Here, I'll hide myself for a second. Household daily items, negatives. Negative across the board, alcohol, tobacco, clothing, negative across the board, plummet in clothing. Uh, educations, negative across the board, recreation, negative across the board, other, negative across the board. So, oh, that's cool. They show you the relative importance, too, at the bottom. Oh, that's nice. Oh, boy, that's pleasurable. <laughs> uh, data partners, JD Power, Zillow, Trulia, Cargurus, AAA. Okay, so you could get rent data, insurance data. Uh huh. Former Federal Reserve insider. Since 2012, Trueflation's correlation with CPI is 0.97. Uh, I mean, that's cool. Quote. But, let's see, is it 
Is that true? Let's find out. Can we go out a little bit more on this? No, I don't think so. Oh, well, I would have liked to have. Well, I mean, let's look at uh, just what all the different CPI reads were. Uh, so, we'll find out. CPI, CPI, line chart, yeah, okay. So, February of 2023, Feb of 23, this was at six, that's at 6.2, okay, so that's pretty right. Then it suggested in March, I don't know where in March, I guess it depends on the day CPI comes out, but whatever. In March, we were, March, we were about 5%. Okay, so we were a little ahead of the game in March, uh, unless you had an early read. It's so early March here, you had about 5%. April, well, let's see, June 30th, we were down at 3%. Let's see June 30th. June 30th. Yeah, it's a little, I'd say it's a little bit of a, ahead of itself. So we're at 3% on CPI year over year. Actually ticked up by September to about 3.7. Right about here. Yeah, it seems to be off by about half percent. So I don't know about that correlation number there. But anyway, it is interesting. Even if you add a half percent to that, it puts you right at 2%, so it doesn't really matter. Interesting. All right, what else do we have here? Some trueflation talk over here. When will you admit stagflation is the most probable outcome? Well, I'll admit that when uh, the data actually supports that because it doesn't right now. I mean, look at, go to ehack, ehack.com. Look at it, it's right here. Here's, here's your inflation. What's, where's the stagflation, bro? Where is it? Because what I see right now is, well, from a data point of view, an economy that's still expanding, which I personally agree I'm shocked by. But then I also see a six and three month below target with inflation. So you have below target inflation and an economy that's still growing. And you're like, what are you gonna admit it's stagflation? I don't know when it's opposite day. It's just, it doesn't align with fact. So, you know, I don't, I don't know. It seems a little nutty. Rates are historically 7%. We need more hikes. You know, I hear that argument and it's like, what, what history are you referring to? Is it just like, you're just trying to average out the last hundred years? Well, you know, rates are were historically low, you know. Uh, well, you know, you, what you have to do is you have to look at inflation, uh, CPI. You have to look at CPI, consumer prices, basically, and the change in consumer prices year over year. And then what you ought to do is understand where where we are so like historic to what period you know because if if we take this whole average sure sure i can make the argument as well that well you know the midpoint of this chart should be like seven percent see that'd be historically the average interest rate fine you could make that argument but you could also just as easily make the argument that if you zoom in to Let's get 82, 1982 to now. You can make the argument that rates probably the midpoint here should be like three and a half percent. So like what history are you referring to, <laughs> right? Uh, and then especially if you, if you look and call COVID a one-time issue, pull this out, get the rest of 82 that's sneaking in over there out. All right, there you go. You know, now, now take the midpoint of this chart. Well, I don't know, two and a quarter, you know, probably where rates average out. So, you know, you really have to ask yourself, what historical do you want, what reality do you want to be in? You know, the, the do you incorporate COVID or not? Do you incorporate the 70s or not? Do you incorporate, you know, the, the, the World War II era or not? So, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's interesting. It's, uh, it's, it's very difficult for me to 
align with the idea that rates are historically low when inflation has, has come down as much as it has. I mean, that's why we've had opportunistic disinflation for the last 40 years. The Fed's slowly driving inflation down. Uh, and, and we almost went too far there for a time. I mean, we were, we were, we were going poopy doopy there with uh, below trend inflation. It was wild. Goldman Sachs, here's my advice to David Solomon right now. He calls that guy in. It's like when I was there, John Weinberg was there. And he goes, do you mind if I ask you what you were thinking? Those were the days. Those were, but it's marketing. You know that. It's all marketing. That's what, that's what drives so much of what goes on on Wall Street. Just marketing. Yeah, of course. So you get an idea out there. It may not be the right one, but it's something that one we talk about that clients will at least engage with. You've done your job. You've done your job. You're telling me that people paid to get on, maybe to talk to, by us, and if they're wrong, it, it, it's just as exciting as the as the people who were right and and get no notoriety. Have you watched ESPN in the past thirty years? Shocking. <laughs> Gambling? If I won, Shocking. All right, you know what? Let's just be Dial Schefter to see whether it's me or not. <laughs> well, all right, I'm, I'm going to call right, him right that's now. That's the one guy I'm who actually Schefter. like I'm delivers Schefter. facts. I'm calling him right now. We're going to find out whether it's me. Do you, want, do you want to do no, this? Don't, don't call him during our during show. During the break? Don't. All right, because it's not, it's not even the same corporation. There's no synergy at all there. Don't do that. The synergy is someone who can be right and, and helpful to our viewers versus people who dug in their heels. How about the six guys? The guys are going to be six cuts. Yeah, I actually wanted to understand this a little bit better. This, how they measure this U.S. labor productivity number. And there's actually a piece in uh, Doomberg about it. Uh, and the BLS has a piece on this as well. So the BLS indicated that labor productivity increased 3.2%. But I want to see how they measure that. This is, it looks like output per hours worked. Unit labor costs and non-farm payroll increased half percent in the fourth quarter. Wow, that's it. That, it's a quarterly number. Uh, so in Q4, that means that's 2% annualized, and uh, which is actually below target. Wow, that's actually really interesting. So in Q4, labor costs were, were well below target. BLS calculates unit labor costs as a ratio of hourly compensation to labor productivity. Increases in hourly compensation tend to increase unit labor costs. Increases in hourly compensation tend to increase unit labor costs. And increases in productivity tend to reduce them. Okay. Uh, okay, that's interesting. So it, it's sort of a combination of, of both of those. Uh, all right. Okay, I'll just write that. That's from the BLS. Labor productivity or output per hour is calculated by dividing the real output, so that's inflation adjusted, by an index of hours worked by all workers, including employees, proprietors, and unpaid family workers. Huh. Okay. And what does Doomberg have to say about that? Uh, let's see... Unit labor costs. What businesses pay employees to produce one unit of output increased 0.5%. Productivity increased 2.7% in the fourth quarter compared with a year earlier, exceeding the average gain of the last 25 years. That's crazy. The rebound in productivity more than erased what was in 2022 the sharpest annual decline on record. This is so weird. 20... The most productivity in 25 years. Uh, okay. Yeah, if I take this. Wow. I, I wish I'll show you this chart here in just a sec. There's a uh, chart of just labor productivity over time. And you can sort of see the ups and downs in it that way. Yep, here it comes. There you go. So here's labor productivity over time. And what's very interesting is the decline. Here's the 2022 decline. And you've basically just completely made that back up where you're essentially at all-time highs again in labor productivity. Very interesting. 
So, uh, again, with Esther George, uh, I think her signaling there was really, once the Fed starts, they want to be ready for a series of cuts. Uh, and then we did also look at the, uh, you know, looking at, uh, that's right, looking at prior FOMC cuts, uh, we can see the Fed frequently cut slowly, then rapidly. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting, that chart. Mm. All right, cool. Now, let's, uh, let's get to a little bit more. So that's on productivity. Then we have... I don't know why, but the market's still pricing in the March cut. Uh, I thought it would have gone away by now, but it hasn't. Let me get a little refresh here on it. It is, it's still sitting in there at 36%, with the market like 90% certain. 90, 96% certain we're gonna get our rate cut in May. I mean, it's, it's almost a guarantee. Unless the Fed's post-meeting speak really kicks it down. See, that's the other thing the Fed could do now. The Fed could come down and basically, uh, or, or come out and suggest, hey, uh, you know, the markets are pricing this wrong. Uh, we actually think we're going to have to maintain this level probably for multiple meeting periods. You know, they do that, you'll start getting red market days, and you'll start slowly unpricing uh, the potential for May, but boy, you'd have a lot of unpricing to do. A lot of, a lot of work to do on that one. Okay, so we saw U.S. productivity. We've got, obviously, earnings today. A lot of delicious earnings today. That's going to be fun. So today, we have Apple, which will be right before its glasses get released or for, to, to the public. That'd be cool. So we have Apple, Amazon, Facebook, I'll probably just go live for these because it's great. You've got U.S. Steel, Clorox. Yeah, so these are some big ones, obviously. This morning we did get Royal Caribbean. How are they moving? Royal Caribbean. I know Peloton missed. I mean, they had more subscribers, but everything else missed over at Peton. Let's see how they're doing. Yeah, Peton's down 7% after their miss. And then Royal Caribbean... Royal Caribbean, yeah, RCL. Royal Caribbean, debt will be close to investment grade by the end of 2024, wow. Q1 EPS of 1.15 versus 91 cents expected, that's pretty good. The forecast for 2024, way better than expected. This is really impressive. Q4 revenue, tiny miss. But their adjusted EPS, beat buck 25 versus a buck 14 and their forecast is great yeah all right good so they're up three percent well that's kind of exciting it's it's weird the economy is being too good uh yeah i see some questions here about like alignment y you know i i'm really excited personally about uh, and, and, you know, I've been saying this for a while, but I'm personally very excited. I feel like you've got this, this like really stretched low rubber band for Tesla and Enphase and the energy, the interest rate sensitive. Uh, and, and then like, it, it, you know, my exposure is like heavy chips and then, and then this rubber band that's like ready to launch of like Enphase and Tesla. This just my, it's just my take, but I think that rubber band launches. And then if those happen to be somewhere in an ETF vehicle, once, when and if these launch, now you start potentially rebalancing to some smaller uh, uh, plays that still have the rubber band unexpanded. It, you know, after interest rates rise, you kind of compare, uh, start falling. You kind of compare where the market is at that point. And, uh, and you could do that without paying taxes uh, if it's done correctly, you know, set up with custom baskets and that. So it's really interesting. So I believe that, uh, uh, you know, and I put my money where my mouth is. This doesn't mean I'm going to be right. That's just my take. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, okay, so what else did we have? So we had Peloton, Royal Caribbean, Honeywell reported. I wonder how Honeywell did. Honeywell, Honeywell. 
Honeywell, 260 adjusted EPS, 259 was the target. Q1 EPS misses. Free cash flow, slight miss on forecast. Q4 sales, slightly missed. Slight miss on 2024 sales forecast. Slight miss on organic sales uh, growth. And somewhat, well, that looks roughly in line, 2024 EPS. So, I don't know, slightly down. Yeah, 2% down. Not a surprise. Okay. 612. Bells in 18 minutes. Uh huh. Let's see. What else? Mike Wilson. Investors should buy high quality growth stocks and opportunities far beyond mega cap tech companies, according to Mike Wilson. We don't think the trade is to go lower quality. It's so weird having Mike Wilson telling us which stocks to buy. Uh, we're not in a recession. Don't overthink it. You need to buy high quality growth stocks and not all the Magnificent Seven. Okay. Last year, markets focused on the artificial intelligence and weight loss stocks, but new themes will emerge for 2022, according to Wilson. Not that bullish on earnings relative to the street. Real top line growth is accelerating, which he dubbed the Magnificent One. While he sort of nodded that to NVIDIA. Valuations are stretched. Wilson said concerns about the regional banking system still weigh on credit growth. New York Community Bank dove on Wednesday after reporting adjusted losses per sh share that the trailed estimates. Idiosyncratic risks are being priced in. It's getting priced stock by stock. It's not systemic. Okay, I idiosyncratic. Just think idiot, okay? Like, like people hear that word and they're like, what the hell does that mean? And, and people use the word to sound smart. Just when you hear idiosyncratic, think idiot. And, and idiot is specific to one. So idios idiosyncratic means one. Systemic means all. That's the way I like to remember it. <laughs> uh... Yeah. All right. It's interesting from Mike Wilson. All right. What are y'all complaining about in the chat here? Actually, nobody's complaining today. Are you going to live stream earnings? Probably. And those are some good earnings. But the problem is Apple's always late, man. Well, well, they're not always late. They they are always just later than everyone else. 4.30. So you have to sit there a lot longer. Well, that's okay. <laughs> you know, I went to a JP Morgan event yesterday. And uh, let's see if I have, a, I have a picture. I think I do. Uh, so I go to this J.P. Morgan event, and some of the, the employees of J.P. Morgan were talking about... Uh, uh, oh, here's some of our interns. Uh, we're talking about... It's like a super small event. Uh, they, they do this for, for their clients or whatever. But uh, anyway, uh, some of them are talking about Jamie Dimon. And uh, uh, where was I going to go with that? So, oh boy, what did you say? Uh, I feel like I was going to go somewhere with my Jamie Dimon reference, but now I totally forgot. Uh, but they were talking about meeting Jamie Dimon, and uh, I don't remember what I was going to say. Oh well, forget about it. We'll listen to Jimbo until I figure it out. It's actually a, a good moment for him because I think that he's gone from being uh, not... Oh. Oh, 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 I remember. I remember now. Uh, Jamie Dimon, he likes to go to, uh, uh, out in, like, he likes to go out in the field and be at the different banks and see people and see America and, and all of that. And, and I thought that was so interesting because it's the same thing that I've always said about, uh, about house hack and, and our real estate endeavors. It's like you have to get out there. You have to meet people and you have to shake hands. Like you can't always just be stuck in the frickin' office. Uh, and uh, I love that. Like I so aligned with Jamie on that. Uh, so so I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, so go Jamie. But anyway, those were some of the J.P. Morgan bankers over there who were uh, suggesting that uh, Jamie said that. So it's it's you know secondhand here. But uh, 
I guess that's that's pretty common for them. So again, I just thought it was cool. Uh, do I have a picture of it here? Yeah, I think I've got a few pictures here. There we go. I finally got them through. They were handing out red envelopes, which I thought was really funny. Look at this. Little red envelope. These were really nice, too. They had little gold coins in them. They were chocolate gold coins, but it's still like like velvety little red envelopes, and I'm like, this is funny. Uh, so uh, then uh, there's us. There's a little private bank. Cool. So, um, excellent. Next. So, beautiful office, by the way. They totally reamed that owner on TI. <laughs> I mean, good for them. Cooling labor market to please Fed, but not workers in 2024. Uh, well, yeah, that's my concern. If you talk to American workers today, they'll probably tell you they're happy to be employed, but not much else. The U.S. economy, which defied economists' expectations for a recession, is holding up well, blah, blah, blah. Gradual cooling of demand for workers is best case scenario for the Fed. Right, getting everything back in balance. White collar jobs are flatlining. U.S. employment and industries paying above average peaked in 2023. Oh, that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, that's that's a very cool kind of chart. More Americans are working more than one job. Uh, that's also very sad, but not highly unnormal or abnormal compared to where we have been. Quits rate plummets. Labor leverage, layoffs, yeah, these don't matter so much. Taking longer for unemployed to find work. Yeah, but this bob's up and down. It's not a big deal. Okay, I'll show some of those little charts. I, I'm a little choosy with the charts that I pick because some of them I think are just noise. And uh, I, I mean, I try to be very balanced with them. But anyway, this is very interesting. So you're actually, if you look at the multi-jobbing, you're right at about the 2020 levels, like before COVID. So I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, JP Morgan, uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Uh, are you talking about the little desk? Let me see what you're talking about. Nobody at the table. What are you talking about? Let's see. Oh yeah, you're talking about this desk. No, everybody was walking in to get settled in at the, uh, at their little event room. This, nobody's actually sitting here. They're mostly because they had another table to the right of this, uh, and that's where all the alcohol was, over here. Uh, and so, of course, that's where everybody was. They were getting their, their champagne. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, what does Kevin do with his free time? J.P. Morgan uh, economic events. <laughs> uh... Lucky money for the Chinese year, yeah. Bro, did your tag say me? What are you talking about? Uh, let's see, what else here? There is different versions too, Kevin. When I was with Chase, we had different ones. What, different, oh, like little, little red envelopes? Chinese New Year style, yeah, it was. No, it's kind of cool. They did a great job. How do you get an invite? Well, you have to be a JPM client, and they they so it's like ten mil net worth. Uh, I used to work two remote jobs at the same time, and I never worked for more than forty hours. Yeah, well, <laughs> there's a reason we don't do remote. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy for you, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've actually got, uh, oh yeah, today's wipe day. We've actually got a great uh, uh, dev working with us right now. He's phenomenal. He's been knee deep in our code and, and he's just working his ass off. We took him to Dave and Buster's the other day. Uh, okay, well that was also fun. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway. Okay, all right. <laughs> so what's this? Kramer's six pack? Oh no. He took out Tesla. <laughs> Perfect. Kramer, Kramer's six pack does not include Tesla. Yes. <laughs> it is the best case scenario. <laughs> uh, see, I work one a job and work about remotely and work six years a week. See, but you're, you're great. You hiring any more interns for the summer? 
I usually don't do summer. We usually do uh, a one-year internship, and, and then, uh, you know, we decide whether we want to give you an offer or not, which we gave all of our interns an offer last year. You know, what's very interesting is J.P. Morgan, uh, and, and probably the banks and stuff like that, they, uh, I guess if you become an analyst with them, uh, they have like, they might have like, what, I think they said like 4,000 applications for like 400 slots. Uh, and then, so you have like a 10% admin rate basically. And then they give you like, first of all, they give you like 80 hours of work a week. And uh, then they, uh, they make you get your uh, FINRA tests. And if you don't pass, you're fired, uh, like within a certain time window. Uh, so it's sort of like the FINRA tests like weed people out for them. And then you have this, uh, what's it called? Um, yeah, I guess like a three-year position as an analyst. And then you could sort of like transfer amongst the bank and kind of move your way up and around. That's kind of interesting. Okay, so... <clears throat> Cues. So, as we go into the morning, we're at about, what are we at? Uh, half a percent here on the cues to the upside. Max says, look at Etsy. <laughs> what the hell? Let's see. Oh yeah, Quan. The, the arcades suck. Like, honestly, I tell my kids, don't even bother playing the games that give you tickets or toys. Just have fun. Like, don't worry about the tickets because they're such a ripoff. Such a freaking ripoff. Uh, the worst are the, uh, the claw machines. Those are such a scam. Like, there should just be a sign on the claw machine that's like, scam. U.S. approves pl plan for, I mean, how long does it freaking take? Should be punishing them the same day. <laughs> I'm getting cursed out in German. Uh, Dave and Buster's, is this a strip club? <laughs> That's Dave and Bangers. <laughs> okay. Uh... Okay, active investor discloses 13% stake in Etsy. Is, is that what happened? Let's see. Elliot. Etsy names Elliot. Mar Elliot's Mark Steinberg to board. Etsy jumps after this. Uh, said to have a have built a 13% interest in Etsy. Oh, that's cute. I mean, it's at the, it's in the toilet. This is the bottom of the fibs I have for it. You can see with my fib diagonal here. <laughs> uh, so, how have we been doing though on the actual earnings for this company? Remember, we do uh, financial analysis and real estate analysis almost every day in the stock course member live stream and the real estate course member live stream. It's all together. It's just whatever everybody asks about. It's a great group. They got like a few thousand people who go through and watch them every day. Kind of cool. Okay, how do I get... Oh, I'm in 2024. Oh, that's still so weird thinking about 2024. All right, so let's look at their November 10Q. All right. Let's find out, Etsy. Let's see what you got. Are you going to go bankrupt? Cash. I got a few minutes before the bell. 742... 235, that's all nonsense. Okay, so that's how much cash you have. You got about a billion cash. Current liabilities, 14, 272. I don't care about lease obligations. Funds payable and amounts due to sellers. Yeah, but that's, that's just an offset of the receivables account, so that doesn't matter. So we have $691 million of free cash. We do have debt, 2.2 bill. Where's your money coming from? Please come from free cash flow. Cash provided by operating 410. Plant property, yeah. That's good free cash flow. $400 million of free cash flow in my nine months. That's great. Okay, so 
free cash flow positive, your net income positive again. Yeah, hey, you know, if the economy doesn't go into recession, could be a bottom for Etsy, honestly. Revenue, what was revenue growth? How did they still grow revenue from last year? Holy crap. 636 divided by 594, 7% growth. Okay, how did margin do though? I mean, their cost of revenue is like nothing. Cost of rev for this year is 29.6%. <laughs> it's like a SaaS business. Yeah, because they're just the platform. It makes sense. So 29 and a half ish for memory's sake. 174, 401, 29 and a third. So their their cost of revenue is like fractionally higher, but it's roughly the same. Their marketing barely grew. 161 divided by 147. Their marketing's up 9% when their growth was up like seven. Okay. So it's close. Product dev, that barely moved. Asset impairment charges, that was last year. So what's our valuation on this sucker? And that's always what it comes down to, right? So what's it trading for? Like 70 something bucks? 73 divided by EPS of last year, 367. It's a 19.4 PE ratio, pretty nice. But then we have EPS growth that's expected to be flat for 2024. So I'm gonna add that in, zero plus 12.3, 18.8, plus 15.3, puts me at 46.4 for four years of growth, divided by four, puts me at 11.6, so 19 divided by 11.6. We're trading for 1.67 peg. It's not bad. Valuation's right, cash flow's good, it's got some growth, a lot of bearishness around it. Uh, you know, I have to say. It's not bad. Uh, <clears throat> we'll just see if they can actually grow. You know, if their growth slows on EPS, then it becomes a little bit of a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I won my two girls a huge life-size teddy bear on the game. They hang them by a string. Oh, the one where it cuts it off? That's really impressive. Dang, man. I wish I was a badass like you. I can't pull that off from my girls. Okay, well, they're three months old, so they wouldn't know, but. <laughs> um, oh, we have a little kid surprise coming soon. I haven't really told anybody yet, but you know how we have like Jack and Max who are six and eight, and then we have twins that were just born in October? That might not be the full story. So stay tuned. Let's get the bell. It's a sporting equipment maker, Amir Sports, celebrating its IPO today. We're going to talk with the CEO, James Zhang and Money Movers, today at the NASDAQ carbon producer, Art. <laughs> I love it when they screw up the belt. Now, Amir Sports, was, the range was 16 to 18. It's priced at 13. Um, as my late father would say, he was a salesman, priced to move. Jimmy, priced to move. You often felt that way about Christmas wrap beginning December 27th. In a, in a, move in a good way? No, move in. All right. Uh, so here we go. 11.3 <clears throat> on Etsy. It's actually trying to green candle. We'll see. NASDAQ's trying to red candle. Tesla red candle. Peloton red candle. Now down about 8%. Honeywell just dropped another percent and a half. Apple turned negative before earnings here. Microsoft still over $400. Uh, Google turns positive after a 7% decline yesterday. Getting the buy the dip. NVIDIA goes positive. You've got Starbucks flat. Wait, $93. What was its day yesterday? Whoa. Wait a sec. What, ha what did they close at yesterday? What? Are you serious? They closed down? They were up like five or six percent yesterday. And then they closed negative? You gotta be kidding me. Let me see. Hold on. I, I, I can't believe it. Oh my gosh. Starbucks just opened up hot and then tanked after earnings. 
right back to the fib. No thanks, boy. <laughs> wow. SMCI, another 3%. Another one. This one's been killing it. I mean, really, just if you're just chip adjacent, you just kill it. Uh, you know, I, I feel grateful I went heavy in chips. Uh, at, at, you know, at, at the end of 2022, everybody was making fun of me for being heavy chips. But I will say, I had the anchor of Enphase and Tesla. So, can't be perfect. Look at that anchor. Look at that little puppy sitting right there. I, you know, I'm very grateful that 175 line is like, it's got like this, uh, ant, what, what's it called when you put like two magnets together? It's got this re repelling effect. Uh, don't come here. <laughs> okay, Peloton's now down 9%. What's moving on the day? Yeah, it's really Etsy, Plug. So Plug's been, you know, Plug's very highly shorted. I, I don't love the company. Uh, I think uh, it's it's a, a tough one to touch, but it's been having a one heck of a little momentum uh, move here the last uh, 12 days or so. Feels like almost every day the sucker's green. But again, a lot of that's momentum, so it's a trade. Actually, not that much red after yesterday. I mean, you got a couple moving red on earnings. You've got Costco red a few basis points. And the Q's stable around half a percent. So we'll see what happens. But it's not bad. Let's look at bonds. Oh, yeah, and how's New York Community Bank? Down another 2%. Yeah. Okay, bonds. Uh, we have 10-year down 7 basis points this morning. Wait, what's the 2? Two? 2's down 3. Oh, no. More inversion. <laughs> no way. <clears throat> Let me see. Let's see what we have here. Yep. Negative 30.4 basis points inverted. Why is Kathy buying SoFi? Uh, I know they have a partnership, which they've talked about before, with uh, their venture capital, I'm pretty sure, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> but, um, you know, Kathy looks for anything that's, that's uh, like, innovative and disruptive. And I have to give it to her. SoFi is, they are, I, I'm so proud of them for <clears throat> getting their banking license. I think that's that's so cool. I, I want a banking license. Very hard to get, though. Yeah, it is true. Recessions tend to happen after uh, you, you uninvert. This is true. So we'll see. Oh, yeah, how's Royal Caribbean? Yeah, I like SoFi. I can't say anything bad about SoFi, but I don't want to own it. I don't know why. I just don't. I, I, I don't know how... I think my concern is... When rates start falling, the you're going to want to keep rates higher to keep your customers happy as, as long as you can, and that's going to start squeezing income. And I don't think mortgages are going to offset that that quickly. And so if I did forecast flat guidance on loan growth, so flat loan growth, I think net interest revenue gets squeezed and mortgage income isn't going to be that great because it's going to take a while to really get into that new refinance regime. So, so again, I'm, I'm not anti-SoFi. I like SoFi. I think they're a great company. And I think their financials and fundamentals are fantastic. I guess I just have more concerns about what happens in an interest rate falling environment. And I'd rather be more exposed to interest rate sensitive stocks in an interest rate falling environment. I actually think they're like the opposite of, of like what you want in an interest rate falling regime. Until you get to the point where rates are so low that everybody's refinancing again. But that's going to be a hot minute. So so that's just my take. Buy New York Community Bank, meet Kevin Bank. Bank hack. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I, I, it's it's just a future vision. I'd, I'd love to own a bank. and But then again, you know, JP Morgan's so good. Like, Chase is so good. It's like, how, how do you compete with that? So you'd really have to find pain points in banking. And usually pain points in banking uh, come from people who don't qualify with the big banks, which means you take on more risk. And then when you take on more risk, you turn into, you know, the New York Community Bank or whatever. 
So banking's difficult, attracting deposits. A lot of banks aren't even banks, you know. Uh, they, they, they just sort of co-brand and they shove all their deposits into somebody that's actually a bank. Well, kind of a funny system. There's plug. Palantir's up a couple. This is kind of actually a benign day here after the Fed, I have to say. Here's uh, Chipotle. All right, let's see what the suits are saying. We haven't done that yet this morning. So, I love SoFi, but I hate their version of Zelle. I just, in general, hate Zelle. Uh, like, it's it's very annoying. It's so much easier to Venmo than it is to Zelle. Okta lays off 7% of workforce. Wow. That's actually a little surprising update there. And I wonder how their stock is moving after that. I always get nervous when layoffs happen and then they uh, the stock goes up. Yeah, the stock's up 2.8%. Yep, that just came through. Well, about 50 minutes here. Okta sees $24 million of restructuring, cutting about 7% of workforce. <laughs> Daughter says, who is this bozo? Uh, bozo the clown. <laughs> Meet Karen staying away from SoFi because Jeremy bought it. Who? Huh. All right. I would love to pitch a specific low-risk loan product to a new bank. Okay. Well, send it to me. Uh, I'm not a new bank, but it's time we your idea anyway. <laughs> send it to Real Meet Kevin on, on X or Instagram. I'll, I'll go into the DMs later. I, I don't often go in there. Any layoffs that me, Kevin? Nope. Hiring, hiring, hiring. What inspired you to short Costco? Read ehack.com. It's literally on there. You just have to, you'd have to hit command F Costco and then go down like seven results. So, Powell's neutral rate implies policy far easier than wonks think. What? Powell in his press conference Wednesday gave a quick back of the envelope trick that he uses for calculating the neutral rate. Yeah, we've already used that. He's told us that a million times before. Based on this estimate, the Fed funds rate will become stimulative at a much higher level, leaving less room or need to cut. Uh, however, it would also be great news for stocks as it suggests that the current level of interest rate environments, uh, of the interest rate environment, is far less restrictive and the Fed is less likely to break something. It's not something you can identify with precision, but a standard approach would be to take the nominal rate, 5.3%, let's say, subtract a for forward measure of inflation, okay? Uh, a forward measure of inflation might be like the five-year, five-year inflation swap forward, uh, five-year and the, or the 10-year break even in bonds. They tell a similar story. Well, that'd be like 3%, okay? So take that off. You're at, you know what, take off 3%, you're at... 2.3 in terms of a level of restriction. But there's a logic to what Powell is saying. <clears throat> if the current rate of interest is stimulative, inflation expectations will rise. If it's restrictive, inflation expectations will fall. And if he's right, it explains why the economic data is still so strong and stocks are close to a record, even with the highest policy rate in generations. Okay, I, I don't know that they really gave us any news there. Record exit from U.S. equity signals tougher start in February, really? Institutional investors pulled out of U.S. stocks at a record-breaking uh, pace in late January, signaling a more subdued backdrop for the S&P. Well, institutions can leave all they want. Morning data shows easing labor market, easing inflationary pressures. We saw that. Powell tre threads needle for soft landing. Fine. Ooh. New York Community Bank looks part... Idiosyncratic, part systemic. Okay, where's the part systemic part? Here we go. One of the problematic issues is that transaction volumes in commercial real estate have essentially evaporated. So valuation of underlying property values is extremely subjective. Unsurprisingly, yeah, you have no price discovery. Unsurprisingly, it seems as if most lenders have thus far adopted a fairly optimistic stance towards quantifying the risks on the collateral backing those loans. Oh, whoa, that's actually a big piece right there. 
Because what they're basically saying is like, hey, if you don't have price discovery, the write downs the banks are doing could be totally wrong. Banks balance sheet has exploded higher recently, including purchase of signature banks deposit base. This is all put it over the threshold for increased regulatory scrutiny and capital requirements. And it seems as if the bank has been a little dilatory in addressing those issues. Lags behind the other banks. Some kitchen sinking announced yesterday in attempts to where, uh, getting to where it needs to be. Those of us can recall in 2007 how many banks took the kitchen sink provisions against dud structured credit holdings only to find losses spill over the edge of the sink and spread further. Ooh. Now there's a banking crisis piece. And this, uh, this guy's smart. The guy who writes this, this guy's name's Cameron Cruz. Badass. Uh, very interesting. Thoughts on Yahoo incorporating in Texas? I give zero hoots. If they want to incorporate in Texas, I honestly care zero. Uh, thank you for allowing Poverty Chat to chime in. Oh, um, let me fix that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Teleports to Camelot. <laughs> wow. It's been so... Cam, Cam isn't that... Um, isn't that to get up to the willow trees up there and the yew trees? Camelot, RuneScape, teleport. Boy, it's been so long. Let me see. Camelot... Yeah, Sears Village. Yeah, it gets you to Sears Village. That's where you have the yew trees. Yeah, uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, right next to the prayer altar. There was the yews. I used to sit there all the time. Oh my gosh. I gotta get my bird's nest, bro. That's cool, man. Cam teleport. Boy, it's been forever since I've heard of that one. End phase gives good guidance. It's like zero chance. Costco's new emergency ki food kits range from $1,000 to $6,000 include 30, 25 to 30 year shelf life items. Doomsday preppers. Wow. Uh, German government now charges us for unrealized gains. Oh, wow. The Germans want your money. <laughs> they will take it. We will take your money. We are not asking. What's the What's the joke? Um, so, uh, well, somebody goes, knock knock. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, no, the the German goes, knock knock. And the other person goes, who's there? We will ask the questions. <laughs> it's so stupid. Oh, it's great though. All right. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so uh, what do we have here? Etsy's still up 9%. Yeah, there goes New York Community Bank. Look at that plummet on New York Community Bank. Yeah. Uh, this is going to be very interesting, this community bank issue. Because uh, I, I think there are going to be more, more of these. Uh, the uh, you know, and, and I think Cameron makes a really good argument that if you don't have price discovery in commercial, how do you know that you actually wrote down that loan well enough? You probably don't. Should we buy New York Community? I mean, it's pure spec. I I you know I can't buy stuff like that. Uh. Wow. Peloton doubled its loss, by the way. Look at Western Alliance. Okay. Western Alliance, Bancorp. Wow, they have very little volume. Dude, it's a $200 million bank. Let's, let's fundraise and do a leveraged buyout. Come on, let's get 50 millis together and go buy a bank. <laughs> Uh, wow. And then compete with SoFi. <laughs> uh, wow. $200 million. Gotta get that banking charter. Uh, okay, so... Affirm's down under 40 again here. Intel sitting at 43. You're getting a little bit more moving red here. 
Uh, oh, and let's see how our BTC is doing this morning. We haven't really talked BTC yet. So BTC 42.4. Let me get some other quick news updates here. Buying a bank is like riding the Titanic. <laughs> but yeah, if you buy a bad bank, it probably is. Oh uh, no, you got you got to get the JPOW guarantees. You got to go in. You got to pull a JP Morgan. You got to buy the bank and get JPOW to guarantee all the dirt. And and now you can't lose. Uh, Terraform Labs says it could be ruined by an SEC fine. FTX plans to repay customers in full. Drop exchange relaunch. Wow. Really? Creditors of the bankrupt exchange, FTX, who can prove their losses, will likely get all of their money back. Wow. Wow. That's great. Okay, so we got some updates to hit. Uh, there's the FTX update. There's uh, so maybe a little bit on Powell. There's the New York Community Bank we hit. Mm, not a guarantee, but that's the objective. Okay, that's very interesting. Good. And then, let's see what else we have here. Binance sued by Hamas hostage. And families and victims of the attack. Tether says profit rose to a record in crypto rebound. Tether is just like, they, they, that's like the lottery ticket. Bitcoin futures demand cools as ETF era concludes key arb trade. Oh, well, this has to do with a, um, oh God, what, what are they called? Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Oh, Block lays off a large number of staffers? Really? Really? Jack Dorsey this week made good on his promise to conduct layoffs at Block. Number was close to a thousand people. Layoffs were focused on workers on Cash App, Foundational, and Square. Wasn't well, that the whole company? Added that operations were getting leaner. Wow. Drastic changes to how performance would be evaluated going forward. Decided to do it all at once rather than arbitrarily. Ooh. Is TMF rocketing again? Well, let's see what the 10 year is doing. Well, yeah, I mean, the 10 year is down eight pips. Remember what I said? We covered this before the, the Fed meeting. We put up a chart where, like, the treasury, the 10 year treasury usually falls after the Fed meeting. Take a look at is that Arizona Bank or. Is it what you said? Uh, right, wrote. Ah, it might be what you wrote. What is this? Arrows. I've never heard of this. Arrows. Uh, I can't find what you wrote. Oh, Azora. Oh, I see. A O Z O R A Bank. Dot. <clears throat> Okay, so this is an OTC security, two billion dollar market cap though, man. That's see, that's an expensive one. You know, two hundred mil. We we could probably come on. We could we should put together. We could put up to together like a reggae and do that, right? <laughs> Did, could this have anything? To, oh yeah, the end of the bank term funding program. I mean, it's not over yet. You could still, um, you know, you, you could still be okay with uh, with that. Yeah, two bill for an OTC. I know, crazy. Let's see here. Yeah, meaning that dipshit stole all the FTX money, but is taking it in the butt suck, so he's giving it all back. Good. God, that guy. Such a scam. Mm. Yes. Love the terminal. House passes bipartisan tax bill. Mmm. Now, 
All right, so what else? I think that's it. I think it's time to push the button and uh, get some more coffee. Probably go to the uh, course member live here. New York Community Bank now down almost 10%. NASDAQ's basically flat here, half a percent today. So pretty stable, Tesla 88 bips, Apple 28, AMD up again, 50 bips, 100 bips on Google, 71 on Nvidia. Oh, Costco goes green again. Enphase up 4%. Canadian Solar's up 4%. Cool. All right, here we go. Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, real estate broker, and becoming a stockbroker, this video is neither personalized financial advice nor real estate advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show should not be deemed endorsed by me. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purpose of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services which we may benefit from. I personally operate and actively manage ETF and hold long positions in various securities, potentially including those mentioned in this video. However, I have no relationship to any issuers other than House Act, nor am I presently acting as a market maker. Cool. Quick look. Everything's about the same. No breaking news? Nope. Alright. See ya. Good luck today.